Good evening, Mayor Calloway, Honorable City Councilors, and City Manager Hammond. My name is Nancy Nye, and I'm the Senior Parks Manager in charge of arts, culture, and events for the city. It is so great to be joining you all tonight. We get to spend the next few minutes talking about one of my favorite subjects, public art. In our presentation tonight, Michelle McCall Wallace is starting off by doing a flyover of the history of our public art program. She will highlight some of the program's outstanding accomplishments and share about some of our current and upcoming programs. Michelle will also provide an update on the Bridge of Land and Sky Highway 26 overpass project. And I know that Councillor Allen will be especially happy to hear about this because he referenced it earlier in tonight's meeting. And then we will conclude our presentation with an update from Tina Bailey on the city's wayfinding project. So what exactly is public art and how is it different than artworks found in a museum or a private collection? Well, I'm here to answer that question and also to give you a frame of reference as to why our city chooses to invest in public art. To begin with, public art is accessible to everyone. It's free, there's no ticket or entry fee required, and you don't have to drive out of the way or get dressed up in your fancy clothes to enjoy it. It adds dimension and interest to both our natural and our built environments. Public art adds beauty, color, and dimension to our landscapes, creating memorable spaces and transformative experiences for the community. Public art can also sometimes be challenging. It can question our assumptions. It may, may, it may make us rethink our perspectives, and it can also provide opportunities for conversation and civil discourse. Public artworks are typically acquired through a transparent process that centers stakeholders and community members in dialogue and decision making. In this way, it is reflective of Hillsborough's past, present, and future, and mirrors the diverse cultural identities and lived experiences of our residents. And when public art is reflective of our community, it can provide a sense of identity, foster community pride, and a sense of belonging. Well, now I'll turn it over to Michelle McCall Wallace, our cultural arts program manager. Thank you, Nancy, and hello, Mayor and Councilors. So I'm going to start off talking a little bit about Hillsborough's public art collection and its early beginnings. So Hillsborough's public art collection began the way of many cities, in the case of the a w Berger family, preserving what is there. The family had a few lives serving burgers and pizza before being designated as a landmark by planning in 1983 and determined part of the city's public art collection in 1990. In another piece, Peter Wolf Toff arrived in town and encouraged others to allow him to carve Chief Nota, one of the city's first public art events with lots of onlookers watching the piece develop. This was added to the collection in 1987 and removed in 2017 due to storm and pest damage. The new Civic Center in 2004 brought several new pieces to the collection, this time with the intent of being part of and further establishing a public art collection. For the exterior on the Tom Hughes Civic Center Plaza, several pieces were placed, including a series of children's games created in mosaic tile, an ancient pet petroglyph reproduced on a riverbed of basalt stones cascading down the stairs. Art was a start, and now the city looked to establishing and formalizing a public art program. In 2008, consultants Bill Flood and Valerie Otani were hired to create Hillsborough's first public art master plan. It was adopted as a guiding policy for the program in November of 2008. It took a while longer for the city to begin implementing the recommendations, one of which was to hire a public art program supervisor. Valerie Otani was hired as the city's first in 2011. Already underway, the Harold Eastman Rose Garden Mosaic was the first project added to the collection, added to the collection in the new program. Many more have taken place over the past 10 years. Some of you might remember Hello Neighbor, which had several different um, temporary projects going on during 2012 through 2016, where students from South Meadows Middle School photographed and interviewed their Hillsborough neighbors. There were temporary displays that were up on banners and throughout town. Um, that you could see, and we did this in several different ways. Sorry if that's moving on you. 
During 2013 through 2015, in arrangement with Sequoia Gallery and Studios, 45 two-dimensional artworks were added to the public art collection. Many of these graced the walls of the Civic Center and other city buildings. Throughout the years, other single donations of artworks have come to the collection, and each goes through an acceptance process and approval with the Hillsborough Arts and Culture Council and the public art program. The temporary Symphony of Light occurred in 2013, an orchestrated, sorry, display of images cast on the Civic Center. Um, and here you can see children were dancing in the color light during the event. In 2013, Barometer by Devin Lawrence Field was placed at the stadium entrance. It's an interactive piece of light and sound. And I don't think there's been a single hops game that I've attended that there wasn't someone, not always kids, playing with the noise that this piece makes. Also, Stewart's Gateway by local artist Tim Gabriel was added to Jackson Bottom. In 2014, a series of pavers were placed outside of the new Shoe Park Library, and a new mural, Bird Child Travels Through Time, was added to the interior. Artist Suzanne Lee worked with students from the Miller Education Center to design gates for the David Hill Community Garden, inviting viewers to get down with the dirt. Also, significantly for the program, in 2014, art murals were made exempt from sign code, opening up the opportunity for adorning the exterior walls of the city. In 2015, sheep on the go were seen throughout Hillsboro with community members checking out a sheep and posting images of their adventures online. You can see one's on the treadmill over here. Um, Jim Smith's dancing chairs, which had originally been on loan, was purchased and installed at 53rd Community Avenue Park. And a large piece, Reflected Past, was added to the new development of the Jerry Willie Plaza at Arenco Station. In 2016, the community got involved with two new public art pieces, Shoot Seeds, where they designed the flower components that are carved into the metal or that are cut into the metal and hidden aquarium and oasis gargoyles where they stenciled designs on Main Street and Aranco Station that appeared for the public when it rained. In 2017, Seeds of Aranco was installed at Aranco Woods Nature Park along with Head Over Heels by Patrick Doherty. Head Over Heels was created with the help of over 150 volunteers and a hundred thousand, I'm sorry, a thousand hours to build and weave the seven heads. It was a well-loved piece in the community, which was visited by over 300 people on its last public viewing day. And in its four years was explored by countless children and parents, acted as a friendly marker for those on morning runs and served as a portrait backdrop to commemorate senior portraits and family outings. In 2019, another community favorite was installed at Amber Gun Park. Elemental Sequence by Dan Nardi. Dan came from Illinois to work for a month on site, casting the forms and talking with those who passed by. For the dedication, local New Vision Dance created choreography inspired by the art. Today, the piece sells, serves as a welcome detour from the park's paths, inviting individuals to meander through or sit and take in the contemplative space. It's a place to sit with family or friends, or for parents and grandparents to play hide and seek with children among the columns. Additionally, in December of 2019, public art supervisor Valerie Otani retired. In 2020, developed as a Eureka project inspiration, the Bridge of Love, a painting by William Hernandez was reproduced in vinyl and installed on the first floor civic doors, civic center doors. Scrappy by local artist Brian Mock was made from donated items by senior center patron and was installed as a guardian outside the senior center's front door. Additionally, in 2020, our collection became part of the National Public Art Archive. The Public Art Archive provides support for our collection management's behind the scenes, but on, its, um, on the website, it provides a public interface through online engagement. So you can see there's a Google Maps, you can find our pieces on the map, you can uh, read about the pieces, and also connect to pieces by artists in other areas. So say you can travel and see other pieces by those artists. Um, and to start off donations to the collection in 2021, we added Dynamic or Orbits by Adrian Lippmann. The piece at Second in Washington has been on loan to us since 2016. It was donated to us by the artist earliest, earlier this year. Now an update on the current works we have in process. Nori Sato, we're still waiting for a title for this one, is a 90% realized with completion to be finished with an upcoming cement plinth 
that will be below the freestand three-dimensional freestanding sculptural piece. So if you visited Hidden Creek lately, you'll see the pieces out there. That's the one portion we're waiting on. Um, Bridge of Land and Sky by Cliff Garten on the Brookwood Helvetia overcrossing at Highway 26 has some exciting new developments, which you'll hear more about in the next presentation. Wapato Woman, through, a, through an intergovernmental agreement, is destined for Rude Bridge Park, cited to overlook the water, la the water launch. And in this moment is a Psyche Grant engagement project for the communities of District 4 and our BIPOC community members, and was done in process with Central Cultural. The project fe features eight local artist heart designs that were stamped onto small wooden panels and distributed to 400 community members to interpret with their colored pencils. The piece is planned for installation at the new Hidden Creek Community Center. And new art for the elevators, we have more coming. Um, we will have Dream and Read at the Brookwood Library and Diversity Collage will be on the garage entrance elevators of the Civic Center. A sculpture by Lee, sorry about that one. A sculpture by Lee Kelly is soon to be placed at the Public Works Building and is currently in the planning and engineering process to make that happen. Now to tell you about what's to come, I'll turn it back over to Nancy. Thank you, Michelle. I'm very excited to announce that earlier this month, we hired seasonal, seasoned public art professional, Carl LeClaire from the city of Boise, Idaho, who will serve as our next public art supervisor starting in September. We are anxious to begin this new chapter in our program. You just saw what Valerie Otani, the city's first public art supervisor, was able to accomplish in 10 years, and we look forward to what the next 10 years can bring. Now, some of the plans that we have for what's next include an update to our 2011 public art master plan and refining our systems for acquisitions and collections management. We also intend to incorporate public art along the Crescent Park Greenway Trail, as well as enhancements to other parks, trails, and public spaces. We also look forward to incorporating some moments of whimsy and awe in the new inclusive playground project. And I know I heard earlier tonight that Councilor Alclair is looking forward to that project. So it's probably not news to any of you that demand for public art is ever increasing. And we hear that desire expressed in multiple community surveys and plans. For example, earlier tonight, you heard some of that interest reflected in the 2035 plan survey report. The 2018 Cultural Arts Action Plan identifies interweave art as one of its five key focus areas. Specifically, stakeholders prioritized a landmark public art installation as a Hillsborough attraction. Now this directive has been incorporated into our five-year rolling public art budget. In addition, the designation of the Downtown Cultural Arts District creates new set of imperatives for, for new public art attractions, including a downtown mural program, a downtown outdoor sculpture gallery on Main Street and the avenues, a signature downtown cultural art event, and the incorporation of gateways and wayfinding to indicate the district. It is now a well-accepted principle of urban design that public art contributes to a community's identity, fosters community pride and a sense of belonging, and enhances the quality of life for its residents and visitors. I'm proud to say that the city of Hillsboro is on the leading edge of delivering this type of high quality, meaningful programming for its residents. Now we're going to segue into an update on the Highway 26 Bridge of Land and Sky project. Michelle? Yes, thanks, Nancy. Um, Greg, Greg Snyder let me know that he's um, detained and would not be able to be here. So I'm going to jump in on this presentation. We were doing it together, but I'll be sharing a little bit more about the whole thing. Um, in Cliff Garden's initial response to the RFP in 2014, he wrote, my artistic enhancement of the bridge takes cues from the city's picturesque surroundings and dramatic skies while becoming a beacon to the city's residents and visitors, signifying a bright future for the city of Hillsborough. Hence the name Bridge of Land and Sky. Beyond the practicality of safe pedestrian fencing, the city's goals were to create a gateway to Hillsborough, make a strong artistic statement, 
express the creativity and expansive growth of the Hillsborough brand and to demonstrate the effective integration, integration of art into infrastructure. So you can see that through that, um, many things have happened in the past year to kind of catch up on that as well. After stopping the project in 2016, the project was picked up again in 2019 and put back into motion. And since then, the city has given its, the city council has given its final approval for it. We've redesigned and done new engineering processes for the piece. An intergovernment agreement has come, uh, has been made with ODOT. ODOT has selected an, uh, an installation contractor and the design and testing of a maintenance friendly light arm has gone on off site. We're now currently looking to do that on site. The Bridge of Land and Sky is in fabrication with Metal Art Studio in Utah. And over the last month, city staff have been working with ODOT on the literal, literal nuts and bolts of the project that will be used to bolt each art, each art panel to the guardrail posts. Staff also anticipates having a full scale mock-up of the entire electrical assembly and the light fixture um, set up complete later this summer for final testing and approval. So here's the original um, first mock-up that we did. These pieces were in um, Salt Lake City at Metal Arts. And um, this is three of the 214 panels that make up the bridge covering both sides. So those panels arrived here in Hillsboro and the public works department did a great job of putting it back together and setting it up out there for us to start working on testing the lighting assembly and getting that going. It looks like the ultimate Ikea project. <laughs> exactly. Um, this is Alex. He is one of the key staff members of Liegman Lighting. They are setting up and hooking up the lighting system. Um, and the panels were painted the, the panels themselves will be a similar gray color when it's all done um, going across that bridge. This is the first test early on. You can see there's still a lot of ambient light and uh, just trying to figure out where things are going to go. But you'll see that uh, we have a much stronger impact that we can make. Um, here it is later into the evening and um, you can see the light coming through the panels. We often think of artwork as one-sided and viewed from the highway below looking up with this piece because it's been talked about that way for so long, but there's more to this artwork than the exterior side. As a two-sided piece of art, viewers traveling over the bridge will get to engage in the piece in an entirely different way as the light comes through the piece and lands in patterns on the guardrail and the sidewalk below, encasing the traveler and the experience. And the artist team intentionally incorporated the fit of the wave structure to look as if it grows or stands stately behind the guardrail with one's eye moving smoothly over the guardrail to the metal, metal wave, much like many of our views of the agricultural land and hills surrounding Hillsboro, when we take a minute to look over the fence. Um, in Bridge of, Art, a Bridge of Land and Sky as a public artwork, everything is working together, each part as a whole of the artwork. The attachment of the panels, the lighting fixtures, the lighting arms, the wiring mechanisms, they're all integrated into the function and importantly, the form of the final artwork on both sides. Unlike public art that is lit separately from the design of the art, in Bridge of Land and Sky, the lighting and all its components are part of a singular piece of public art. Um, here you can see that quite a distance of the impact that that light makes in that far right panel. Um, right now we're looking at uh, doing more of the light testing to figure out what exactly we need out there with, the, with the, how many light arms, how far they're spaced, we know that we can have them two panels apart at this point, but maybe we can have more. And um, you can see with the impact, we're trying to figure out uh, which, what is the impact, what's the lighting we can do without a major overflow of lighting as well. Um, so here we've been testing the colors. And what I'd like to say is this is just a really strong color shot without really giving you all of the possibilities. With the energy efficient LED lighting from Ligman, we have over 2 million programmable colors available. So the possibilities are exponential. So light can move gently, it can fade and reappear, it can transition in gradations and undulate across the surface, covering the wave of metal in color changing light and shadow. And the artist Cliff Garten will develop an assortment of color display as he explores along with the city, not only our expectations, but the possibilities. Um, the public art over Bridgewood will be a landmark gateway serving to address the goals 
in the 2035 community plan, just as you heard about earlier today and Nancy mentioned as well, as well as the cultural arts action plan. And there are very few highway passes in, in Oregon that have been treated as art gateways. And this one will be unique in all of Western Oregon. So for next steps, um, we are looking to finalize that lighting design and electrical plan. And if that's submitted, ordering the LED lights and selecting an electrical contractor, we will need to close down, uh, ODOT will need to close down the highway for us to do that lighting. So we're gonna do that all in, in uh, sort of all in one symphony and movement to do that. And, um, and then hopefully in spring of 2022, we will be looking at the installation of the 80,000 pounds of steel and a dedication ceremony to follow. Thank you. Next up is Tina Bailey with the Wayfinding Project. Good evening, everyone. Um, obviously, wayfinding in its simplest form is directional signage to provide uh, guidance to our community members on how to reach certain destinations. And if you left it up to us engineers, they would be green and white signs on little telephone posts, little uh, square posts out of the public <laughs> right of way. Um, we would also look like every other community out there uh, in that circumstance. Um, so in 2014, in conjunction with the city manager's communication team and parks and recreation department, the wayfinding program was born to do more than just communicate to the public where to go, but also through that um, program, provide some sense of place and community in the city of Hillsborough that when you see these signs um, that you recognize that you have entered and been welcome to the city of Hillsborough. If I could have the next slide, please. There are several components to the wayfinding program. Um, and obviously they incorporate art, otherwise we wouldn't be here tonight <laughs> presenting to you. Um, what you're seeing here is what is called the gateway design, gateway art for the wayfinding program. On the right is the, some of the conceptual art. And these types of gateways are planned for now five districts that we have identified in the city, which are the downtown core, Aranco, Tannisborn, the North Hillsborough District and the South Hillsborough District. And you will see on the left-hand side, and this is a picture of the actual installation that we put in several years ago in South Hillsboro. Um, and it is actually contains art in both the sign topper or the sign blade as we call it, and then the panel insert on the bottom of the sign. And those are unique to each district. And I'll be showing you a little bit more of those later. I can have the next slide. We also have um, kiosks that were part of this meant to provide community information. Um, these are digital kiosks that have screens in them that where we can change up uh, information that's displayed on the large rectangular portion, as well as a reader board that goes across the top of the display. You'll probably be familiar with this one. We have the first one of these was installed in the Civic Center Plaza. Um, we also have another one of these installed over by Shark um, and the library in the parking lot. And there is a third kiosk like this in the um, TriMet station on Third Avenue. Like, and, and those incorporate a little bit of the art in this, they have, there's a sign blade that's incorporated between the uh, TV screen display and the, the scrolling display that's on the top of the board. You could go to the next slide, please. We also have static, um, static displays that have more kind of wayfinding of, of once you've reached a campus. This here is in the back of the Civic Center on Washington Street. Um, you can see the exceptional art on the left, the actual final installation on the right. And this really provides just a, a overview of the areas within the downtown core and where the various things are that you might wanna go visit to help you locate yourself. It's kind of a you are here type of map. Um, we also have additional maps like this in the Aranko Station Plaza. Um, and there is also one in Tiana's Horn. I can have the next slide, please. Slide, please. And then we have um, vehicular and pedestrian wayfinding. And you can see the tops of those incorporate art blades um, in the signs. They have a decorative post in a lot of cases where these are installed. And these will generally direct you uh, from a vehicular standpoint to the various districts first. And then once you enter the districts, you will be, um, you will be guided by both pedestrian and the vehicular signage to key wayfinding things like parking, 
transit, parks, um, and other features. In some cases, there's a general broad uh, shopping in this general direction, very broad categories other than community things that um, we might want to direct individuals to. I go to the next slide. And then, of course, once you get to those destinations where you're a little bit closer in, we provide, uh, again, guidance into the parking monument signs that will tell you that you've reached these particular destinations. Some of these signs have begun to be installed in the downtown core. Um, there are still some of them to go. There's some pedestrian signage directing you to destinations and some of the early parking signs have been installed, but uh, we have quite a few that we still need to, to install. Next slide. The other thing that was envisioned as part of this was banners, bikeway signage. Um, you'll notice the Hillsborough H came out of this network of this program as well. Originally, the program had some key signs um, for some of our major streets like TV Highway, Evergreen, where we installed the Hillsborough H logo on the sign. That is now incorporated as part of our design and construction standards. So all major roadways get the Hillsborough H so that you know you're in Hillsborough when you're driving around looking at your street signs. And if I could go to the next slide. So back when we were envisioning this in 2014 to 2016, we actually master planned most of the city. Um, and we have identified sign locations. All those little dots on the screen are actual individual sign locations. And all of the destinations have been laid out for all of those various points of the city. Um, we are constructing those in phases, though, because that is a huge endeavor for us to undertake. I can go to the next slide. <coughs> Now we get to the meat of why we're here, which is the artwork. Um, Parks and Recreation works with um, to acquire artist Susan Lee, which I don't, Nancy and Michelle might be able to give more detail on the artist itself, herself. Um, I was not working with her, but she was given some kind of parameters for, or some themes for the various um, districts within the city of Hillsborough to design some artwork. And what you're seeing on the left are the, the internal panels and the sign toppers for the downtown district. Um, and she was given kind of the theme of historic traditional main streets in the, to, I kind of pull out the huge sequoia trees and you can see a little bit of that uh, reflected in the art. The location on the right is Aranco State, uh, the Aranco town sites. Um, it was given a theme of transit oriented, uh, contemporary urban design along historic district, uh, with a historic district. Um, large, you know, family, a family location and large native white oak trees. And you'll see that reflected in the, the train being in there, the trees that are incorporated in the two pieces of art. Next slide. On the left is the Tanisporin district, which was given a theme of retail energy, young and diverse population and urban. So you see the pathway kind of coming through a park with the trees um, on that one. I bet you couldn't tell the one on the right is North Hillsboro. <laughs> that <laughs> incorporates our tech and our tech element. Um, theme high tech, innovative industry, circuit boards, solar panels, airports, and you're very much seeing that mix of the agricultural and the um, circuitry that is up there in the North Hillsboro uh, North Hillsboro area. And then if I could go to the next slide. The last area is South Hillsboro, which is really um, a mix of everything. They were given the theme, she was given a the theme of unique residential districts and town centers in a walkable community. And so you're seeing everything incorporated kind of within that, the farmland, the businesses, the, the walkable community and both of those toppers. And if I could go to the next slide, please. So to date, um, we are working on phase one. And as I indicated, we've, we've got informational kiosks in downtown Orenco and Tannis Warren. The Hillsborough H logo has been incorporated. Um, we have the South Hillsborough large gateway signage that was placed in there. We are currently working with Oregon Department of Transportation on permitting for um, the west of the way finding signage for the downtown core. And that is proving to be challenging, although they were involved in the original layout and selection of these locations. It's been several years. Um, they've had some turnover and the individuals no longer are as supportive <laughs> of the concept. Um, remember I said engineers would like to have green and white signs and that's what we're facing is a little bit of a challenge. Um, they're used to working in very rigid high speed environments and so they're concerned about uh, safety should somebody strike these. We've been able to get really, really creative 
um, and move some of these signs into our right away off of Baseline and Oak Streets to um, get through most of the permitting. There is one sign, however, that we have not been able to relocate and ODOT seems to be holding that permit <laughs> for on us. Um, so we're still working on that. If you could go to the next slide, please. Phase two, which is programmed um, in fiscal year 21, 22, and 22, 23 at 1.5 million, 5 million is for the vehicular way signage for the rest of the city and an informational kiosk in South Hillsboro. Um, that, that assumes that we can get this all in the right of way. There are, are, are a substantial number of signs in this phase that fall in both Washington County and ODOT right away. They are larger signs. Um, and we have some concern that we are not going to be able to get permits and that we're going to have to seek easements for some of these um, signs to be placed on private property. So um, I'm hoping that we will stay on track with this one, but it may be a little bit challenging as we work through the permitting system. And then if I could have the next slide, please. There was also kind of envisioned at the time, um, South Hillsboro was just a concept, really. We were still working on the South Hillsboro uh, concept plan when we were doing wayfinding. So we knew it was coming. We developed the arch. We obviously developed the gateway sign for it, but we didn't know where the parks were going to be, where the parking, where the shopping really was going to be. So the master planning for um, South Hillsboro was never done. And actually um, part of North Hillsboro was also not envisioned. We do not have anything really west of Brookwood Parkway and north of Evergreen in the wayfinding program. Um, so that would need to be developed for the vehicular and pedestrian signage in the future as another phase. Um, there was envisioned and um, a Brookwood gateway piece over, over Brookwood itself. That was um, really before we had the bridge piece on Brookwood Parkway over Highway 26. So um, I don't know if that's something that we would um, you know, continue to want to pursue. There's also um, additional gateway signage for the other districts and some interpretive panels that were envisioned. And then even deeper down than that, there was there's signs developed if we wanted to uh, sign our bicycle way network with this type of signage and give it that same type of treatment um, going forward. I believe that is my last slide. So I'm happy to answer any questions about the program if you have any. This is great. Yes, Council President. Thank you. Um, not so much a question, but compliments all around. I think uh, all three of you did an awesome job of this presentation. And I really, and I mentioned it earlier in the meeting, I really like the public art piece that goes over the Brookwood overpass. I think, um, you know, this has been something we've been working with ODOT on uh, several stops and starts to try to make this happen. and. It's finally coming together, that 80,000 pounds of steel and light, it's gonna be amazing. Um, it really is gonna be so much better than a cyclone fence. It's gonna turn that, that area into a destination. And I just wanna you know, compliment everybody's work to help get us to this point, because it's exciting to see it come together. So uh, thank you. And the wayfinding program is another thing on my time on council, I've kind of seen that blossom over time. Um, and it's, it's exciting to uh, see that develop as well. So just thank you so much all around. Thank you. We were we were just delighted that it was picked back up, you know, because it it did have that um, period of time where it had, you know, just gone into hibernation and then it was picked back up and um, supported and, and we're just thrilled. And it, you're right. It is a lot better than a cyclone fence. It world's better and it'll put Hillsboro on the map. You know, it'll really um, bring a lot of uh, positive attention to uh, that art piece and to the city. Yeah, and I was looking at the, the traffic counts in that area on Brookwood by 2040, I think it's over 60,000 on, on Brookwood. And for Highway 26, it's gonna be over 100,000. So that is gonna be a highly visible project to lots of people visiting our community and they will identify Hillsboro with, with that intersection. So just, uh, I'm really excited for it. Thank you, good job. Thanks. Councilor Allen, if I could say something really quick as well. Um, I think uh, Michelle kind of touched on this, but those lights, you talked about like 2 million different light colors, you know, that we can have on there. We can program those anytime. And so we can, you know, depending on what's going on in the city or events, we can make it, uh, we can change the light color, which is going to be super cool. And uh, 
uh, yeah, I, I, I thought that was pretty cool anyway. I think I saw Councillor Martin and then Councillor Pace. I'll defer to Councillor Pace because I have some questions about what is and then public art in general. So, uh, Thanks for the briefing. It was very informative. I'm looking forward to the bridge over Brookwood. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait to see the. I was going to ask about the lights. So uh, Robbie, thanks for doing that because I could see it lit up for hops or the Olympics or or whatever. Like when one of our high schools go off to state championship and curling whatever I don't know so I just think it would be cool to, you know to just have that representative of the city and I um, I appreciate it being picked back up um, and thanks for the really deliberate and, and thoughtful nature that you approach this uh, I do think uh, it provides delight and happiness throughout the city so thank you for your work here thank you this Councilor Alcare, I really appreciated the presentation. And when I think of this bridge and that art, the only other one that I can think of is in the Dalles with the salmon. So yeah. that makes us unique. And um, so I really appreciate uh, how it came together and what vision you have for it. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I will say great job on all fronts. I think I have a couple uh, questions and comments about uh, things like one of the things we had talked a lot about public art. Uh, one of the things I was curious about is we had talked about integrating art into infrastructure. And, you know, going to other cities, I see a lot more art in the right of way or areas like the one, one place I went to that I was shocked at how much public art there was, was Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. I mean, it's just everywhere. And, and I was wondering if, uh, Dina, if you could just talk about kind of barriers to that and how we're trying to overcome those barriers, that uh, overcome barriers isn't just for you, but I know that there's some kind of engineering issues, but I'd love to see more public art just kind of everywhere and I'm hoping you could talk about that. Yeah, so obviously we're concerned about safety elements of it. Um, so that's why you generally see very little of it except when we get into some structural components. Um, wayfinding obviously is one, as we build roundabouts, um, we've been looking at putting art in the center of our roundabouts. That's a, um, a delicate thing as well is that we want it to be art that's visual, but we don't want you to actually walk to the roundabout to go look at the art. So there's some balances there that have to happen. Um, I think there's opportunities for art as well in um, bus shelters. Uh, you, we've seen that with the, the Brookwood Library has a very unique bus shelter out and through there that incorporates art elements. So there's places for that. Um, that's generally where I see public art um, installed, places where a vehicle is not likely to jump um, and strike it and we're not likely to impale a vehicle with pieces of the art. I'll, I'll just add in um, that one of the uh, programs that we're excited to implement um, with the with uh, the dovetails with the cultural arts district is a downtown rotating um, outdoor sculpture uh, art gallery. And so it would be temporary on loan, um, large scale, large-ish scale, um, on loan sculptures that would sort of dot the public right of way, the sidewalk um, along the Main Street downtown district in the bulb outs. So of course, we're gonna be working very closely with Tina to ensure ADA accessibility when we do that and to make sure that you know people can pass safely, there's enough egress, but there are all <laughs> sorts of successful programs in the right of way for that. Um, and we have an existing, or we did have an existing uh, sculpture that was down off of yeah. Third in Maine, yeah. um, which again, situation where it was a small enough piece and it was on breakaway bolts that we were comfortable putting it in that particular location. Um, so those are the things that we're looking at is, you know, is it breakaway? Does it obstruct vision? Does it obstruct, obstruct um, the, a person walking? And is it too much of a distraction that, um, you know, that, that drivers might be, my drivers might be distracted and actually cause a crash. I was going to say one of the things related to distraction is um, as we're talking about the lighting on the Brookwood Art Place, 
don't get crazy about doing Christmas carols and flashing it because Odon, Odon will probably have a sure. uh, not be happy with us about that one. But you know, static display changeovers, of course, um, could happen at any time. There, there will be some limits, yes. Yeah. The, um, and, and the piece that you're talking about that was at Third and Main, that's one of our pieces that we've had on loan. And what, what Nancy's also talking about is sort of expanding on that whole concept in that program. Um, the piece, we have two pieces that we had on loan. Uh, Jim Smith's chairs, dancing chairs, which were purchased and then installed at 53rd in a much grander way. And then the new piece from Adrian Lippmann that came to us this year. Um, those were on loan pieces that we had as temporary pieces that, you know, we basically became embedded in the city and part of the city and and that we were able to, to embrace those and bring those in. So I think there'll be more of that as well. Um, also the mural program, you know, expanding public art, not just into three-dimensional objects that people could run into. I guess they could run into walls too, but you know, so thinking about thinking about public art in multiple ways um, and the the partnerships that we would put in place with developers and businesses and places to make that happen. From a, from a wall perspective, I think it's things that are visible from the roadway that are just, you know, there's there's an opportunity um, to put things very close to the roadway, but not in the road, roadway for people to enjoy them as well. So I, what another, another piece of that too is I really love the emphasis on kind of the higher traffic areas, say your uh, Main Street, Tannisbourne. But I'd also love to see it further into residential areas, think uh, your collectors or uh, uh, intersection. Like uh, uh, the easiest example for me, just because it is a literal one in one out, is like at the front of Arbor Roses would be a great example of a place that in integrates art into a slightly lower capacity area. So like a place where people still see it, but it's one that, uh, you know, there's less worry. It's not necessarily on the arterials. Um, I, I just really love the idea of really integrating art into the fabric of the city and I love the uh, focus on specific areas like Main Street I think that makes total sense but also going further of you know looking even at the collectors at the at the at the places where people would drive by you know working with the school district to potentially do that on there and but things like that are things that um I I I I hope, uh, and the, the rotating art sculpture sounds really great. Uh, murals, I'm really glad you brought up, or uh, I guess, Councillor Pace, you had a question? No, go. Okay, uh, murals uh, you brought up, which I'm really glad. I, I'm glad that restrictions have been reduced, uh, but I definitely come at it from a, why do we have restrictions or regulations at all? Like, why, why can't we just allow folks uh, to a lot more license and artistic freedom to be able to pursue uh, murals or painting on the side of walls. I've, I've heard from folks that it's, it's, it's fairly difficult. Even now it's difficult. I've heard that from several folks. And, and I definitely approach it from the mindset of like, why, why do we have these regulations at all? Uh, you know, so I was just curious to get that, uh, uh, your thoughts on that. I think that's a big conversation. And I think Nancy wants to weigh in too. Um, you know, really it kind of comes down to um, um, freedom of speech rights and, and, and what you can and can't say and what you can and can't do. It also comes down to safety what Tina was talking about. What kind of materials are we using on the walls? What kind of things, what's happening in the process of putting them up? Are they being put up safely with the scaffolding and, and those kinds of things? All of those issues are at play and that's what we check on. Um, I'm excited to say you know, we, we're putting together a meeting. Uh, the Arts Council didn't have a meeting this month but we're putting together one very quickly. Um, and pulling people together so that we can look at a boys and girls club proposed mural. Uh, so, you know, I, I think we're working to make that process easier. Um, you know, originally it was in sign code and you couldn't do it at all. We've moved it into the process so that we are still involved as a public art piece. It's not a private art piece. This is the public helping to make that decision. The public are on the committees and inform that. So they're part of that process with the murals. And we are trying to always look at ways to make that more user friendly. We are also, it's part of the cultural arts action plan, looking to, to go into neighborhoods and to develop programming where you know we might provide funding and grants or ways to ways to do things in smaller neighborhoods and have them be more community driven. So we have done some projects um, working in that direction too, and would like to do more of that, which then often brings up more of the community engagement projects within public art. Councillor Martin, I'll just um, add on a little bit to what Michelle just said. So 
Um, I think it's a great, great comment that you made about why not more murals and why aren't we making it easier for people to do that? Why, you know, let's let's break down the barriers for engagement and enthusiasm to to for expression. Um, you know, a couple of the things are who owns the building and approvals and um, permissions for for you know those painting. And then also who's responsible for the maintenance, for the ongoing maintenance of the piece. Those are two things that are always a consideration. But I do want to let you know that in part of the cultural arts district programming, we've been um, researching a program that's put out by Regional Arts and Culture Council that's called Fresh Paint. And it's a temporary mural program that engages BIPOC artists. And it's something that we're looking very closely at for the cultural arts district. So lots going on and lots more conversations to be had, but thank you for that particular comment. I really appreciate it. And thank you. I, I just am so passionate about trying to give folks that microphone and that, that paintbrush, that spray paint can, whatever it may be, to express themselves in the diverse ways that we have, both art and people in this community. Uh, I, I really appreciated the new, um, yesterday I saw the, the elevator, the new vinyl elevators, which was great because that's a, a, a different art style than what's often kind of um, what we've often shown. So I really appreciate that kind of diversity and, and want to make sure that that can happen. Um, my last question, I only have one more question, Councillor Pace, so I'll be I'll be relatively quick. Uh, one of the things you brought up was in 2017, Chief Nota going away from Shoe Park, which was a um, something that a lot of folks really found identity in, uh, a sense of place, creating that sense of location. And, you know, since then we've talked about trying to update, incorporate, try and in incorporate our um, uh, indigenous and, and, and folk, uh, folks who lived before us roots in the city of Hillsborough. I was wondering what we have as a plan to, to both replace and to honor uh, the land and the folks who came before us, our indigenous neighbors. And, and, and you know, potentially, I know I love what Five Oaks Museum has been doing about highlighting art artists, uh, BIPOC artists who are uh, really doing a lot of innovative stuff. So I'm, I'm curious what we're doing in that realm and uh, specifically with uh, that area for Chief Nota and, and how we are going to kind of replace that uh, art, uh, that piece of art in the, in the hearts of our community members. So I'll, I'll start and I think probably Dave and Nancy might want to weigh in there a little bit on that. Um, with, uh, and before I, before I do, I want to say that um, we are bringing one of the Five Oaks Museum pieces by Stephanie Littlebird Fogel to Hidden Creek in August. And it's a piece where she has um, uh, annotated the panels, the historic didactic panels about the Kayapuya tribe. And so it's, it's from a contemporary perspective, looking at that language and looking at that the way that it's been presented and really sort of raising that question. So it's gonna be a really interesting um, piece to bring those panels in there, separate aside from the question. Um, with Chief Nota, um, you know, the piece was damaged with uh, pests and um, had been damaged in the storm and needed to come down. It, it wasn't, um, it, and it, I would say it was before a public art program was really in place, as you know. So, you know, a lot of things just sort of happened with that piece <laughs> as, it, as it went in. Um, and since then, we have gone out into the community and did a whole um, survey process and engagement process with the community that uses that park and it lives in that neighborhood to say, what, what should be here? What, what do you want to see here? What does this look like to you as it comes back? You know, so um, we have all of that information gathered. And I will say it's not necessarily speaking only to the indigenous people in terms of what they're looking for. Um, also, the Grand Ronde, Grand, Grand Ronde tribe um, let us know that that piece did not speak to the local tribal area, as we know, it was sort of done as a, as a standard interpretation across America. Um, so we are looking at doing that. We were working heavily on that piece when our public art person retired, and we do have it funded and or planned for funding. Um, and budgeted to happen to grow. It'll be you know, over a few years to make something happen there. Um, we have kind of kept all the other pieces going because that one had not started yet, um, but that will definitely be a focus coming back as, as we get a new public art supervisor and pick the program back up with the, um, in terms of programming. And I don't know if Nancy and Dave, if you had other comments about 
um, the shoot park project. Dave, I'm deferring to, uh, no, I'm deferring to you, Nancy. Uh, you guys are doing a great job. So I'm just here to say great right. job. Um, well, I'll just um, remind um, everyone about the project that is coming to fruition very soon, actually, um, that we've been working on very closely with the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde. And we're working with a Native artist, um, Travis Stewart, who is doing a carving um, entitled Wapato Woman. And that um, installation will be um, at the Rude Bridge Park Water Launch. And, you know, Wapato was a very important food source for the indigenous tribes. Um, and also that location being right there at, you know, one of the waterways uh, that was a very important location. So as far as honoring and recognizing um, their um, presence, both historically and in contemporary, um, I think we're, you know, working toward that. There'll be an interpretive panel also at the Rude Bridge uh, watercraft launch that talks about the um, indigenous uh, tribes. So I think we're going to be responding to that, um, you know, that loss of, of, of the chief Nota there. But again, we are being very intentional about what we're doing at Shoot Park in re reaching out to the community members and doing those surveys. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the intent, uh, the intent that goes into public art. I think it's just such a critical piece of our community identity, creating that sense of place and that, uh, that common experience. So thank you very much for the work you're doing. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, Council President. Thank you. I'll make this uh, quick. Um, one of the things that I have really enjoyed uh, through visiting other cities, I, I uh, visited, actually I was in Tokyo for some time uh, and I saw these living art walls, the plant walls, if you're familiar with that. Um, they have them also in the LA Public Works building when I visited there. Um, and I've seen one in Hillsboro, which is uh, actually at the Embassy Hotel in the Tannisporn area. Um, I would love to see more of those living art walls. There's really great examples if you look online of, of different uh, communities and what they've done. But they, I mean, they bring literal life to a room and it, it, is, uh, it is really beautiful if done uh, right. So I'd encourage you to look at that maybe in some of these uh, public spaces. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Councilor Ryan Beverin. Um, just briefly, I, I really appreciate, and this is more wayfinding and, and sort of identity, but um, dividing the city up into smaller districts that people can identify with. I, uh, it's, it's, you know, we're kind of taking it for granted, but in, as I grew up in Hillsborough, it's a small enough community where you were just part of Hillsborough. But now I think people really identify with South Hillsborough, for instance, or Rinko or other places. And to have the wayfinding identification, I think is, it strengthens that um, sort of um, neighborhood uh, feel of the community, and I know Portland's, uh, you know, brags about their their neighborhoods and that sort of thing. So it's it's nice to see that as uh, going forward as uh, a way for people to end up identify within a district or a neighborhood. So I just wanted to point that out. Also, I, I think that uh, public art has a huge impact on our active activity. I know that uh, uh, professionals and uh, uh, high tech and uh, young and creatives love uh, public art, and uh, and I think we undervalue what it, what it adds just in a, to the economics of our city, the future economics of our system, city. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Councilor Pace. Uh, thanks uh, again for your um, thoughtfulness around the murals. I I was recently traveling in Park City. And there was a Banksy mural. Uh, I don't know if you know the world-renowned muralist Banksy. And people didn't know it. And then they graffitied it. And then it was saved. And then people freaked out and were fighting over it to get pictures. This is a mural. Okay. Then they covered it. And then the city freaked out about that. And then they put glass over it to preserve it. And then the glass was shattered. You can still see the mural. 
over a mural, right? So I do appreciate you being very thoughtful about what you're doing going forward. And about the public spaces and near roadways and stuff, I'd like to recommend the center of the roundabout at Harewood and Jackson, if we could place <laughs> Mayor Calloway's mailbox in the center of that, I think that'd be uh -huh. great. He'd really get out into the community and see everybody and just make it super easy for him to check his mail. Um, and it, it could be a, a living art installation, like what, what do they call those? Like actually, you know, watch the mayor get his mail kind of thing, you know, actual. Performance art. Performance, Performance art. art, thank you very much. <laughs> Which would mean then that I'm gonna get a PO box. <laughs> This is Councillor Alcare. I um I grew up in San Francisco and there were all those murals. And I don't know if people ever asked permission to put them up, but they are works of art. And so I um I echo Anthony. It's like figure out what the regulations are and if there are barriers in those regulations, what we can we do to remove them? Because um if we're valuing that, then we're valuing freedom of expression wherever it comes from. And so I'm just curious about what are the regulations and, you know, are they worth taking a look at to see what could be changed? Yeah. Absolutely. So, Councilor Alker, we have been doing some of that just to, to let you know that is also on our radar too. Um, you know, sort of making it so that it's an easier process just to understand what the steps are you know, with sort of a handy diagram to kind of step through that, um, you know, putting the public art supervisor in the role of, I would say, taking your hand and walking you through the process rather than stopping and asking you about the process. That's been a big change too, you know, over the past few years. Um, and we're starting to see them pop up in the area. Another big part is really trying to find the funding for them and to make that happen for businesses that want to make that happen and to pay an artist because artists do this for a living, you know, so how to how to help that happen and marry those two together as well. Um, but the long term care is a big piece and and sort of the partnership agreement that the person who owns that building really says, I want to keep this up for five years at least. And that's what our, our agreement is right now. But um, but I agree, we can always do that with all of our processes. And, and, and we've done that with our grants and some other things is to keep looking about at, you know, how to open that door wider. And, and I think that's a goal within cultural arts to do that. The urals are, I, I think, are a great reflection of um, the way people feel in particular times. Yeah. Of social movements and reflections about what um, people might experience. So I, um, I'm glad and I'm hopeful and look, looking forward to seeing more. Thank you. Thank Forest Grove has a mural, has a wall and every few years they put a, a new mural on it. And um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thought, you know, in terms of it not being permanent, um, mm -hmm. you know, but it, it changes and it reflects um, maybe as, you know, Councilor Alcari, as you said, you know, a societal movement or a specific time. And, um, and in that way, you know, I've always believed that, you know, it's like art should be permanent, but then, you know, head over heels and that beautiful stick art, which was meant to be temporary. And, um, and the same thing with the, um, you know, the art on the sidewalks with, with the rain and, uh, you know, and even the chalk art that we have in the Civic Center center tonight um there's also something pretty special about art that um has a has a shelf life uh, as well and um you cherish it more um any other any other thoughts i just can i just add steve that um yes. art mayor that uh sure. the 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 technology has come a long way you know, so you were talking about seeing the elevator doors wrapped and those are those are coming from paintings that are just small paintings by these artists. The artists are painters, they're not muralists. This mm -hmm. is helping them make that leap into being a muralist. So, you know, just the technology of vinyl, for example, allows that possibility. So I think that we can start opening things up in, in those ways too. And we're looking at that in cultural arts as well. Ways, ways to make things happen, uh, just like those elevator doors and, and give those opportunities, make those opportunities possible. Sorry, thank you. You know, um, there's a certain symmetry to tonight's meeting because our first presentation was Hillsborough 2020 or 2035 update. And 
going back to the original Hillsborough 2020 vision and action plan, there were a number of vision and action or action items that were related specifically to public art. And, um, you know, and, and that, you know, so as we talk about the things we're doing now, that came from our community over 20 years ago. And it is so cool to see, um, you know, that that has continued, that, um, that what was a priority then continues to be a priority now. And, um, and I just, I, I love that because it, it no longer is a council legacy or mayor legacy, but it is truly our city and our community's um, legacy, but, but also a gift to subsequent generations. So that's really cool. Um, and I had one question, the um, mural panels, the mosaic panels that are on the side of the Sequoia building. Is that part of our public art or was that just a project, you know, that Lynn Adamo did with, you know, community volunteers um, that was part of Sequoia. And even though that was kind of a partner with the city, it was not considered part of our public art. So th that, that raises an interesting question. Um, it's part of the public art process um, and it is, not, it is not a permanent part of our collection. Okay. So we have a process that, uh, that you know, makes sure that, we that um, the easements are there and that there's a guarantee. You know, they sign off that they are gonna take care of it. Um, we check on the materials and those sorts of things. And, and this was one of those situations where um, Linda Holland uh, sort of walked through that process with um, the public art supervisor at the time to create that. So it's not that we want every single thing that's made in the city to be part of the public art collection and handle it that way. Usually that goes through a whole different process. The public art process, which Nancy talked about earlier, really has stakeholders and community members helping to make that decision. It's public funded and public chosen art. And that's not the situation with this. And so this is right. taking what would, would have normally fallen under sign code and putting it into a different kind of permitting process essentially, um, or a different kind of process to remove it from that because um, the sign code would have limited that. So this opened the door for us to have community members doing those pieces. So that so kind of lives between the two. And that would then also be the same as the um, artwork um, that's at m, &M Market you know, which, um, yeah. you know, was done by Linda Holland and uh, which again was phenomenal, beautiful oh, pieces. Yeah, but both of those pieces were funded through our Hillsborough Arts and Culture um, grants, our project right. grants. So, so the city did participate in, and, and help make those happen too. Yeah. Well, and then last, last thing, um, and, and she was mentioned in the report, but I, I think um, worth closing, worth closing the work session with is just, acknowledging the uh, remarkable life and uh, gift yep. of Valerie Otani. And not just to Hillsboro, but you know, all throughout our region, uh, what a remarkable uh, human being and um, her legacy and her gift uh, with her vision, you know, just will continue to, to speak to our community and our hearts uh, for many, many years to come. So thank you for that. Thank you for recognizing her contribution. So mm -hmm. great job, everybody. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful work session, wonderful report. And uh, we, I think all of us can hardly wait for, um, you know, for the installation of the Brookwood Overpass art. And um, let's see, I'll get over to the library and see those elevators and the elevators on the garage level entry you know, that mural is up on the elevators. And uh, so very, very cool, very exciting to see. And uh, so thank you all. And uh, with that, our meetings adjourned. Have a great evening.